We are so glad that you can join us here at Living Stones Church. As always, we would love to connect with you. So if you can just take a moment to reach out or subscribe to us on social media, we would really appreciate it. Now we're currently on an exciting series called Made for More. We believe that God has created us to love more, to care more, to forgive more, to enjoy Him more. In short, that you are made for more. So here it is, our senior pastor, Pastor Ron Johnson. Have you ever had a day when you come to church and you just had a miserable morning and the devil's just piling on you, mm, ha, kicking you, because maybe you had a fight with your spouse in the car on the way here? And I know I'm speaking theoretically now, probably most of you have never experienced any of these things, but then you come to church and what's the devil do? You phony, you hypocrite. What's he trying to do? He's trying to take you out of the game. Don't let him do it. Just say, Lord, please forgive me for my attitude. In fact, if your spouse is next to you, what a great place. This is a new idea for some of you. How about at church? Ask for forgiveness. <laughs> you can actually do that here. You can get your relationships right with God and with each other right here. It's amazing how that works. Anyway, right here, right now. There you go. So here's, here's chapter 3. If we don't have an encounter with Jesus that's real, that, that truly changes us, we will never be able to fulfill the mission of God. But have you found that when you have an encounter with Jesus, he starts working you on the inside, and you just start getting rocked, and you experience more and more and more, and you go from glory to glory to glory, and you get changed, because that's what the love of God does. So we need, chapter 3, we need to experience more of the love of God so we can love more. And today we're getting this big shift, all right? I love the way the Apostle Paul does things. He lays a theology of some big ideas for us, and now in chapter 4, which is what we're going to hit today, chapter 5 next week, chapter 6 the following week. But today we're shifting because the Apostle Paul moves from the principles to the practice. He moves from the doctrine to the duties we have to obey his word. He gets very, very practical with us. So today, you're probably not going to leave after we read chapter 4 going, wow, I never, I never saw that before. No, what you're, gonna, what you're gonna say is, wow, I need to get serious about allowing the Holy Spirit to produce these kinds of fruits in my life. Because listen, today we're gonna talk about doing more. All right, chapter 4, doing more. Look with me in, uh, at verse 11 through 13, Ephesians 4, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I did a whole series, as you all know, called Gifted, and we spent a lot of time in Ephesians 4, particularly in these verses, but I want to read them as reminders. It says, these are the gifts that Christ gave the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why did God give these gifts to the church? Their responsibility was to equip God's people to do his work. And in the process, build up the church, which is the body of Christ. How long is this going to go on, Pastor? This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and the knowledge of God's Son that we will be a, a mature in the Lord. That's the goal, maturity, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Notice this is not individual maturity. This is corporate maturity. This is all of us growing together to become the church that God has called us to be so that together we look like Jesus, we act like Jesus, and Jesus becomes the standard of our development. Now I want to show you a, a, a website if you check on the screen there, fivefoldministry.com. Write that down. I encourage you to make sure you understand how God has uniquely wired you. And while I shared that on these fivefold gifts, uh, all of us are not moving in the office, for instance, of the pastor, or teacher, or evangelist, or prophet, or, or a, a prophetic person, but all of us are, have a wiring that is one of those five gifts, and all of those functions need to be moving in the church. We, we already hammered on some of this, but I, I just want to remind you, we need to have the apostolic thrust. We need to be outward sending and growing. We need to be prophetic in terms of knowing what's God's heart and staying in alignment with his heart heart. We need to be, we need to have the teacher gifting to ground people and establish people. We need the shepherd's heart to love and to nurture. We need the evangelist heart to gather lost and broken people. All of those have to be functioning. Now let me just share with you, somewhere along the line in church history, people got this idea that the people that are supposed to do the ministry stuff are the clergy folks like me. In other words, people that are pastors or people that are priests or people that are clergy in some way, they're supposed to do the ministry and your job is just to show up, 
Give a thumbs up, maybe help out financially every now and then, and then we're good to go. Uh, and, and then we do weddings, and we do funerals, and baby dedications, and, and that's kind of what the Christian life looks like. But how many of you know that's from the pit of hell? That's not it at all. Our job is not to do everything. Our job is to equip all of us so that together we do more together. In other words, we're not putting people on pedestals here. This is not Ron Johnson's church. I, I cringe whenever I hear somebody say something like that. No, no, this is Jesus' church. Don't ever put your pastor or any pastor on a pedestal. Have you noticed lately that pastors who are trying to do it all many times are pastors who are burned out? Pastors who are committing suicide? Pastors who are falling into moral failure? That's because the model's wrong. Something's wrong with the template. We're all called to be engaged. Everybody's called to be on the move. Everybody's called to know their gift and use their gift. And I want to show you this from Scripture, just to establish this so that we get it right. Everyone's been uniquely gifted. We talked about that, that you have to take that gift in and use it for something. We're called to be disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And I want you to get this. If we can get this in our DNA, I'm talking about we, I'm talking about you. You are a disciple. How many of you love Jesus Christ? You follow him, you're being transformed by him, and you've agreed to go on mission with him. It's about him. It's his dream, fundamentally. So how many disciples in here? I want to see you're following Jesus. Okay. Now that we know we're disciples, now we, now we learn, okay, how am I gifted to do this uniquely? That's the whole gifting thing. But here's the end game, and I want you to see this. I need to be mentored by a senior leader. So I rub shoulders, for instance, with Pastor Dick. I've been blessed here. I have many, many godly people. Brother Rod last week. We got Pastor Keith Tusi coming up. I'm surrounded by many wonderful men of God that mentor me, that I get and glean from, all right? I take what I receive from them. My job is to be intentional about sharing Jesus with other people and helping them grow. But I don't just share with them. I share with them this concept, and this is huge, that all of our jobs are to take what we receive and be intentional about giving it away to somebody else. And I want to share this with you. If the church gets a hold of this, game over for the devil. Okay, I just, can I share something else with you? Satan really doesn't care that he lost you. You know, he lost you. You know when you really get his attention? When you start robbing hell from other people and you start teaching them to do the same thing. Now you have the devil's attention. Because he can go, oh, well, I lost you. Okay, uh, he still torments you from time to time. He gives you a hard time. But when you really want to get his attention, just start sharing the gospel with somebody else. Start giving away what you've received. Start watching somebody who's a baby Christian grow and become more mature. And then all of a sudden they start witnessing to them, their friends at work and hell starts to get plundered. Heaven starts to get populated. And now you have the devil's attention and he hates it. That's why he's trying to make spectators out of believers instead of seeing the church mobilized into action. And can I just tell you as a little secret, you will never reach the full measure of joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment that God has for you until you are fully engaged, partnering with Jesus, partnering with the local church, and expressing the unique masterpiece God has made you to be. You'll never, ever experience satisfaction chasing your career, chasing a woman, chasing a man, chasing money money, chasing whatever it is, you'll never ever experience the degree of satisfaction that God wants you to experience when you partner with him and you use the unique gifts he's placed in you to disciple somebody else who disciples somebody else who disciples somebody else. We all should have a vision. Hear me on this. We all should have a vision for spiritual great-grandchildren. I didn't say children. I didn't say grandchildren. I said spiritual great-grandchildren. That should be our vision. Are you all with me on this? Yes. And everybody, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, seriously, are you grabbing a hold of this? Because this is, this, is, this is awesome. And what I'm telling you is if you come to Living Stones, you cannot hide. You know, I've heard people say, well, we go to the big church over there, blah, blah, blah. And, and really what they're saying is this, I can go there and nobody will know. And I can leave and nobody will know. We know you. 
And we know God has a great purpose for your life. And we're not going to let you waste your life by hiding or sitting on a bench and watching everybody else be engaged because we know that you'll never experience the fullness of joy that God intends for you until you're all in. All right, I'm going to move on before anybody tries to sneak out the back of the church. All right. What's the goal in this? Here's the result, Paul says, if we're all in. Then, verse 14, you will no longer be immature like children. Oh, this is so good. No, I told you before, it's good to read through the Bible and read through other translations just because they highlight certain nuances. I love the message paraphrase. Listen to the paraphrase and tell me if this doesn't speak to us. This is what verse 14 says in the message translation. We're not up for any prolonged infancies among us, please. Let me try to explain what this means. Have any moms or dads in this place besides moi ever given this amazing speech to one of your children? I've said this before. It was a great speech. Your mother is not the maid around here. Wasn't that a great speech? That was a great... Your mother is not the maid. Translated, that means... Pick up after yourself, clean up after yourself. Oh yeah, by the way, take the garbage out. That would be great too. And the point is simply this. No freeloaders in this house. We got lots of stuff to do. And here's the deal. When you mature, I love this, when the garbage goes out without my continual reminder. I mean, sometimes I... Sometimes I pull the car in and I'm greeted. The cans are at the curb. And I'm like. <laughs> because what? I'll tell you what's happening there. Maturity. Maturity is a beautiful thing. When you have a 30 year old and you're still changing his diaper. That is, that is not a beautiful thing. And can I just tell you this, in the body of Christ, physical age has nothing to do with spiritual maturity. Um, if you're 60 years old and we're changing your diaper because you're a baby Christian, hallelujah, bring me the wet wipes, all right? That's a good thing because you just got saved, but you're a baby on the inside. But listen to me, when you've been hanging out in church for 40 years and we still got wet wipes... Your mama ain't the maid. That means all hands on deck. And I found this to be true. I've said this before. I never criticize my wife. And you're going, oh, pastor, you're such a godly man. No, I'm a desperate man. When you have eight kids, you're grateful for whatever help you get. I could care less if the toothpaste is rolled up correctly. I could care less what the toilet paper, what direction is facing. Are you kidding me? We got eight mouths to feed, eight bottoms to wipe. Are you kidding me? I am a happy man. And I found this to be true. People in the local church that roll up their sleeves and start serving, they're happy. You know who a pastor's biggest critics are? 30 years old, still wearing diapers. Just had to throw that in for effect, all right? If you're a stinker, it might mean you need to get engaged. Because people that are serving are some of the happiest people and grateful people on planet Earth. People that are critical, way too much time on their hands. Little side note there, just throwing that in. I'm reading on before I get in trouble. Jesus makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Can you say that with me? Fit together. This is what I get. All right. The church of Jesus fits together, which means everybody finds their home, which means if people are at each other, rubbing on each other, butting heads with each other, that is dysfunctional. That's not normal. 
Say, oh man, I was raised in church, man, I know how bad it can get. No, that's a sick place because the church Jesus has fits together perfectly. Which means, and I've shared this before, if you're sticking out, you know, you're all bent out of shape, but you look around you and there's like 500 other people that are happy. It's like the man that called his wife, honey, be careful, this crazy person on the road, I just saw it on the news, they're driving down the interstate the wrong way. She says, no, there's not one, there's hundreds of them. <laughs> um. <laughs> that speaks for itself. All right, I'm moving on. The church fits together. <laughs> the church fits together. Look what it says. When everybody does their own unique work and helps the other people grow. Why are you here at church today? I'm here to help people grow. How about you? I'm here to encourage people. I'm here to love people. Now, trust me, I also have needs, but here's what I found. If I'm focusing on helping people grow, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to get what I need, because that's the way the kingdom of God works. You have a unique gift set that fits perfectly together in this place for the purpose of helping people grow. What does that mean? Become more like Jesus. Move them forward in their journey. In their walk with God. Help them move along. This is so good. This is in the Bible. Hallelujah. And here's the standard. What is our gold standard at Living Stones? We already preached on this, but man, I love to repeat it. So that, so that, so that, that means here's where we're headed. The whole body is healthy, growing, and full of love. Oh, that is such a beautiful trinity right there. A holy trinity. Healthy. That this place is a healthy place where people can grow and where people are filled with the love of God. I want to go to a church like that. How about you? So what does this mean practically? All right, let me get real practical with you because the rest of this message, practical, 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 practical. What that means is we're here to love men, train, sin. How many of you heard that one before? If somebody asked you on the street, this is really important. Hey, what's that Living Stones, Rolling Stones place all about? You know, what do you guys... What do you guys do over there? Well, here's what we do. We love people. We help people get mended. We train people. And then our goal is to launch people to do what they've been called to do. Let me ask you guys this question. This is not a, this is not a, a, a critical question. I'm not trying to put guilt on anybody. I'm just asking, it's a good question. How many of you have been effective this year in your workplace and simply pointing people to Christ and sharing the love of God with people, not here, but where you spend most of your time. Some of you that are out there working 9 to 5, 8 to 4, 3 to 11, whatever it is that you're working, how many of you have been loving, mending, training, and sending in your marketplace, in, your, in, in the place where God's called you? Because part of this message, again, is that this is not where all the action takes place. Some of you are running businesses. Here, here's what I want to ask you. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at some business owners right now. How does the fact that you are a lover of Jesus cause your business to express itself differently than the business down the street that has the same name as yours or is involved in the same stuff that you're involved in? In other words, how, how, is, how has God uniquely gifted you to express who he is out there in the marketplace, which is really your mission field, not here. Everybody likes each other around here. We, we come here, give hugs, high fives, all, but that's where the action is. When is the last time you were able to pray with somebody or love somebody in a tangible way or lead somebody to Christ or give hope to somebody out there? Let's go to the next slide, Rach. Here's, here's something else we do around here. We like to grow people and we want to multiply leaders. Everybody gets worried about that multiply leader thing. But if I minister to Pastor Dick and lead him to Christ and I help him grow and I say, hey, you, who, who's God put in your life? And you go, well, you know, my neighbor, Ed Krause, he doesn't know the Lord. And so 
Pastor Dick starts loving on Ed, inviting him over, and they build a friendship, and, and they, they get to where they can share, and then guess what? You start sharing your heart, and Pastor Dick starts offering hope. Well, guess what? You're a leader now, because you're actually taking what you receive. I'm leading. You're on the track for leadership, because you're going to take what you receive. Can we stop freaking out about the word leader, and just embrace it, that God's called us as his people to be leading planet Earth? We're supposed to be in charge. That makes the world nervous, but we're supposed to be in charge in every arena of life, bringing Christ and bringing the gospel and bringing truth. So we're going to love people, mend people, train people, send people. We're going to grow people. We're going to multiply leaders. How about this one? We're not going to come to church. We're going to be the church. We're not going to be spectators sitting in the bleachers. We're going to be on the team, wearing the jersey, in the game, everybody contributing. How about this one? At Living Stones, we're not about superstars, but we're about hero makers. By the way, we still have that cool blue t-shirt. Somebody need to pick that up. It's out there in the Connection Center. The Hero Maker t-shirt. It's a reminder that it's not about me. It's about who I can impact through what Christ has put in me and the legacy that I can leave in the lives of other people. We're hero makers. We're not passive learners. We're movement makers. And I love this famous quote from Pastor Dick. I didn't give him credit, but I'm giving him credit now. But I didn't put his name up there. How many of you know there's a sat in Satan... And they go in God. Think about it. Satan's goal is to get you seated, not moving, chilling, hanging out. God's goal is to get you on the go. Going where? Going with Him. Being a part of the mission. Being on assignment. And I'll just tell you, people that are going are happier than people that are satting, sitting with Satan. All right. Um, so be a goer, not a sitter. Uh, it's important. Let me quickly get in the last few minutes we've got. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, because Paul has got a key word here in Ephesians 4, 1. From chapter 3 to chapter 4, there's this word, therefore. Read it with me. Therefore, he says, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord beg you, man, I circled that in my Bible, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. Another phrase for calling is your divine summons from God, for you have been called by God. I love the way the message paraphrase says it in modern language. Paul says, in light of all this, here's what I want you to do. Well, I'm locked up here, a prisoner for the master. I want you to get out there and walk, better yet, run. Run on the road that God has called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. Isn't that good? I love it. Makes it so simple. In other words, how many of you know if you're here today, you've, you're here by divine summons? You didn't choose to follow Jesus because you had a great idea one day. Jesus apprehended you. He chased you down. He tore the blinders off of your eyes. He showed you the greatness of His glory and beauty. He changed your heart. He filled you with His Spirit. Am I talking to the right crew? This is Ephesians chapter 2, right? He overcame all the obstacles against us. Jesus conquered everyone. You are here by divine summons. Paul is sitting in prison, which makes this all the more poignant. I'm going to know you listen to people in jail for their faith, because it's real. Paul is saying, I plead with you, Jesus, I plead with you. Live a life worthy of the divine summons of God upon your life. In other words, don't waste the life and don't miss out on the call. How many of you need to hear that today? Your life matters. How you live your life matters. The gift of God on your life matters. You're not a normal person. You're a kingdom person under divine summons. How do, I'm going to move ahead here a little bit. How do we walk worthy of the call? Let's take a look at what a worthy life looks like. Read with me Ephesians chapter 2. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. This is so simple, but I want you to get it. Listen to what Paul says. Always be humble. It's going to get worse. I'm just sharing with you guys. This went over like a lead balloon first service. I apologize. But it's in the Bible. So we're just going to read the Bible. How do we live a worthy life? Well, we're humble people. 
always be gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults. Why do we make allowances for faults? Because of our love. How many of you know, let me just pause here. If you're married, this stuff's really good in your marriage. Always be humble, men. Always be gentle with your spouse. If you happen to find a weakness, I know there's probably none because she's your queen and you love her and you married her and you chose her, but if you happen to find one little one that pops up every now and then, have forbearance, meaning you overlook it because you love her. Mm, this is so good. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Hmm. So how is it that we're different and we're movement makers and we're shoes or something like that? So Bill showed up at church barefooted and very disheveled looking. And he didn't show up at a church like Living Stones where if you look around, we have people dressed in all kinds of ways and there is no official dress code here, all right? Although we do prefer that you wear clothing, all right? But that's the, about the only thing. But Bill showed up at a very conservative church. All the men wear coats and ties. All the ladies were dressed to the hilt, high heels, jewelry, earrings. Bill shows up down the center aisle and he starts looking for a seat. On that particular Sunday, the church was very full. So Bill's making his barefoot, disheveled self down the center aisle looking. Can't find a seat, can't find a seat, can't find a seat. He makes it all the way to the front. Everyone's eyes are on barefoot Bill. And he just plops down right in front of the podium, front and center, folds his legs, and gets ready to worship. A strange sense of uneasiness and tension filled the sanctuary. Everybody's wanting to know, what's the leadership going to do with Barefoot Bill? All of a sudden, a seasoned, gray, mature elder from the back of the sanctuary starts making that slow walk down the center aisle. Everybody's wondering... What's going to happen next? The senior saint comes right up next to Bill. Everybody is waiting for an explanation on why Bill cannot sit there in the front. And the senior saint, who doesn't bend as easily as he used to, makes his way down to the ground, folds his legs, and proceeds to sing the hymns next to Barefoot Bill, right there in the front of the church, which led to the fact that the entire congregation has now moved to tears and an emotional basket case because that was a picture of what we just talked about of somebody older and wiser been around a little bit longer wasn't dressed like barefoot bill but as a father in the faith met bill where he's at demonstrates humility gentleness patience forbearance peacemaker as opposed to an agitator you know, let me just say this. Over the years, I've had people get all up in arms about all kinds of things. You know, so-and-so doesn't dress modestly. So-and-so, uh, the guy doesn't dress modestly. Uh, so-and-so came to church like this. So-and-so wore this, wore that. How many of you know Jesus has an amazing way of bringing people along in the journey of maturity if we would just love them every step of the way and not get hung up on what they are dressed in, aren't dressed in, but just love people where they're at. Amen? I remember sitting in a life group one time with a brand new believer, the, the former owner of the Aurelio's restaurant. We had the privilege of leading to Christ. I invited him into my life group. The first life group, we went around and we shared our goal, our vision for what we wanted to see happen. And I got to Mike. And let's just say Mike was a little rough around the edges. Here we are in this wonderful co-ed life group. And Mike says... I want to be a confident SOB like the rest of you people. <laughs> Only he didn't spell the letters. In all of his glory, that came out in my living room. <laughs> I just started laughing. I said, you know what? You keep hanging out with us, you are going to be a confident SOB for Jesus. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Now, that's not acceptable as we mature in the Lord. We're not supposed to have potty mouths. In fact, 
Let's go to Ephesians 4. I'm wrapping up here. I got five minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. Check this out. Instead, this is verse 23. Instead, instead of all these other nasty ways of behaving, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes and put on your new nature that's created to be like God. Listen, if we're going to do more for Christ in the world, we have to act differently, which means there's three news that need to happen. We need to think differently. Can anybody say amen? Our attitudes should not be like our unsaved uh, colleagues at work. Our attitudes should be different. And our nature, the core of who we are, has been transformed by Jesus, which means we act differently by nature because it's our new nature. Let me get real practical with you. I'm going to end with this. Jump on down to uh, verses 25 through 27. This new thought, new attitude, new nature is going to lead to a transformation in three important areas. I'm going to cover them really quickly. Number one, transformed mouths. Paul says here by the Holy Spirit, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we're all parts of the same body. Don't let or don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Listen to me. When the gospel takes root in us, it changes our mouths. Can I just say this loud and clear? As a Christian, profanity has no place in our lives. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I work in a pretty rough place. I do understand. That's why God placed you there. Because you're not going to talk like everybody else. I was at the club the other day. A guy I was talking to nearly had his toes chopped off. A beam fell on them, took off parts of his toes, just severed them right off. Steel girder, he's an iron worker. And he was dropping F-bombs left and right about his toe. And I just went up to him. I befriended him over, over the time I've been there. And I just said, praise the Lord, your entire foot was not taken off. I said, you know what, we're going to pray that the healing continues to happen in your toes. And you know what, he went from dropping F-bombs, he said, yeah, you know, I really thank God, because that could have happened. <laughs> uh, you know, I just, I just thank God, thank God. I mean, all it was, every other word was an F-bomb going off, and all I did was adjust the thermostat. I just adjusted the thermostat. Some people, when they get around f-bomb droppers they start dropping their own f-bombs because they just want to fit in or something no you're called to stand out don't let foul language this goes for marriages too no abusive language in your marriage quit verbally abusing your spouse with names profanity we don't talk that way. In fact, how about this? People, people, well, you know, I'm not so sure about that gift of speaking in tongues. Isn't it amazing that the first organ that the Holy Spirit takes over when he gets full control is our nasty tongue? We have no problem cussing out the neighbor, but we're not sure about tongues. Maybe God knows something you don't. And maybe if you gave God your tongue, he would do something to bring glory to himself and he'd change you from the inside out. All right, I'm going to mess with you some more. We need transformed hands. If you're a thief, the Bible says, quit it. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work. Why? So that you can give generously to others in need. I heard a woman coming up, talking to a teacher on, about biblical finances. The guy was teaching the class on biblical finances. The woman came up and said, would you please pray for my son? He said, sure, what's going on? My son needs to know the will of God. Well, tell me about it. Well, he just graduated from school. Uh, he's got his degree, uh, but he doesn't have a job yet. The, the teacher said, uh, is he eating? She looked at him all weird. Is he eating? She said, yes, he's eating. He lives in, at home with us. 
And the teacher said, I cannot pray for your son to know the will of God because he's already out of the will of God. And the lady said, well, what do you mean? He said, the Bible says if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. Why is your son sitting in your basement waiting for a job to drop out of heaven when he should be out doing whatever he can do, putting his hands to the task? How many of you have found that when you take a job that might not be what you were trained to do, might not pay what you need, but you put your hands to the plow, God opens doors to get you the job that you do need. But if you wait around, and can I just say this? If you wait around doing nothing, you're already out of the will of God. Because listen to me, hard work is a Christian virtue. And I want you to see, it's not just working. It's working so that you can be generous. Sometimes I think we create so many problems in America because we're more compassionate than Jesus. I say that tongue-in-cheek because there is no one more compassionate than Jesus, but I think we have a bad definition of compassion. I heard of a pastor one time who kept a shovel in his office, and whenever anybody came in that needed help, he said, great, we'd love to help you. Do you mind taking this shovel? We've got some work to do outside here at the church. Do you mind taking the shovel and working for half a day or a day, and we will bless you with resources? He said in all the years he did that, he never had one person stick around. And some people would call that unchristian. No, the Bible says work is a godly thing. And when you get saved, you stop stealing. And you start working. And you start producing. And you start giving. That's a sign of spiritual maturity. Last point I'm going to meddle with you. And then I'm going to set you free to a better day in Jesus' name. No, I'm kidding. How I many you know this is good stuff? It's in the Bible. I'm not making this up. This is not Pastor Ron's opinion. This is in the Bible. Last thing. Transformed mouths, transformed hands. We need transformed hearts. Look what the Bible says. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Remember, He, the Holy Spirit, has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. God sealed you with the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you this question. If you're struggling, you're saying, ah, Pastor, the Bible, you know, the Bible's not coming alive to me. God's not speaking to me any longer. I just feel so distant from the Holy Spirit. Let me give you some help. Anybody want help? Let me give you some help. Get rid of bitterness. Get rid of rage. Get rid of anger. Get rid of harsh words. Anybody under conviction yet? The altars are open. We can all just come running. In fact, I'll put a pause right here and I'll just hit the ground myself. Stop slandering people by talking about them behind their backs. As well as all other types of evil behavior. That's to cover anything that we were missing. Can I just share this with you? As soon as a man or woman loses her temper, we just crimp the oxygen hose of the Holy Spirit in our heart. Can I just tell you this? The Holy Spirit doesn't hang out with angry people. When I get angry and I lose it, and I've done that before, instantly I feel the grieving of God in my heart. You know why I feel that? Because I'm born again. And because that's not how I'm supposed to act. And the, and the Lord's saying this, I am so grieved over how you just spoke to your son. And then I have a responsibility to do something. Because listen to me, you cannot have a great relationship with the Holy Spirit and be angry at the same time. There are people that say, you know, I just don't feel close to God. I'll tell you why. Because you're still walking around in unforgiveness. Your heart is full of bitterness. You're still holding that person and you're never going to forgive them because of what they did to you. Let me just tell you something and this should scare you. You'll never have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because He will not hang out in a heart that is full of bitterness and unforgiveness because that's not how he rolls have you ever been in a situation before when the conversation turned to talking poorly about a brother or sister in Christ or somebody that you work with and instantly you feel like the whole atmosphere got polluted that's because it did get polluted it's because you defiled somebody that Jesus died for and until we guard our mouths and we guard our hearts.
we will not be able to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is a word for some of you this morning. I'm asking this question. Do you value the presence of God more than you value holding somebody by the throat? Here people say, well, I wouldn't be angry if she wouldn't make me so angry. That is a lie. Take responsibility for your garbage. When I lose it, I can't blame my wife. It's my anger, and I have to own it. Our marriages would be incredible if we grew up and we stopped blaming other people and we took responsibility for us. And we started pursuing Christ's likeness and we started loving our spouses, irregardless of how they're acting. We started loving our spouses with transformed minds, transformed mouths, and transformed hearts. That's what separates us. That's what shows the world that we are different. So we got to get rid of this stuff, get it out of our lives. How do you get it out of your life? You ask the Lord now, Lord, forgive me. And then you make it right and you choose to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Are we going to do this perfectly? Of course not. Are you ever going to lose it? You probably will. But here's how you tell when you're mature. The spaces between the fall get wider and wider and wider. And you know else how you can tell when you're growing? You don't nurse it like you used to. I had somebody come up to me during communion one time. They had been at this church for years. Don't worry, they're not here now. They said, Pastor, this is during communion. Pastor, I have, an, I have had unforgiveness in my heart for you for over a decade. I wanted to look at him and say, dude, I feel sorry for you. Whatever it is I did wasn't worth that. You just put yourself in a cage for a decade. And the crazy thing was, I didn't even know what I did. So that, not that I was innocent, I'm not, but I don't even know what I did. So this person carried around the corpse on their back for over a decade. They never experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit. They ne I guarantee you there was no fruit in their life. I guarantee you they didn't walk in the joy of the Lord. And for 10 years, carry that crap around. I'm, I, I use that term intentionally to get your attention. That's exactly what it is. Why in the world, why in the world, when Christ is offering so much, would we continue to hold that person in prison? I'm not suggesting what they did wasn't significant. I am suggesting this. The power of the Holy Spirit is greater and more satisfying and more blessing and gives you a future if you'll just let go. Make a choice to stop being angry. Oh, wouldn't it be good if we just said, I'm sick and tired. I still remember the time when I fell on my carpeting in the basement, on my cold basement floor, and I bawled my eyes out because my attitude had erupted into anger, and I knew I hurt one of my kids, and I laid on the floor, and I said, God, I don't know why I'm this way, but I hate it, and I want you to change me. I don't want to talk that way to my kids. I don't want to act this way. I don't want to be angry and wound up. God, forgive me and change me because I can't change myself. Do you know that was the beginning? That was the beginning of God starting to do something in my heart. I haven't arrived yet, and none of us will till Jesus comes, but I'll tell you what, I am on the journey. And I'll tell you what, it breaks my heart whenever I don't respond with the right attitude or with the right words. It breaks my heart because the Holy Spirit does live in me and I want to be a man of God. And I want to experience the fullness of God in my life and I want to embrace the call of God on my life. I don't want to be walking unworthily of the divine summons of God on my life. So you know what? I want you to hold me accountable. I want to love you. I don't want you ever to be uh, irritating to me or frustrating to me. I don't ever want to walk in pride. I want to walk in humility. I'm confessing before you. Help me be that person I'm preaching right now because I'm just a mouthpiece, but I got to live it in my own life. But I'm telling you, if we will work on one another, we'll see the glory of God in this place. And we're going to impact a lot of people. We'll be a part of this globe-encircling movement that Jesus has called us to be a part of. It's going to be awesome.